Okay, we have about uh, 25 minutes left here for uh, some questions. So at this point, I'd like to uh, ask a couple of my colleagues, Robert McBride from Toronto, who is the first vice president of LAI, and uh, Aurelio Ramirez uh, from our Madrid chapter uh, is here as well. So they're going to circulate with some microphones. Uh, we have some pre-prepared uh, questions in place, but uh, uh, we would really prefer to uh, hear them from the audience. So if you have a question, here's your first one right here. Um, hi, Miles. I have a question for you. One thing you didn't touch on um, is interest rates. And uh, obviously, with uh, what's going on with the currency rates at the moment, um, inflation is an issue. I wonder if you could just comment on <coughs> um, whether you think um, the inflation pressure is going to lead to a rise in interest rates, because obviously, you know, that would have a massive impact on net rates values with energy promotion. Um, so until uh, Bank of England came out with its inflation report uh, this week, we were forecasting a further drop, I'm on the radio, okay. um, a further drop in um, interest rates by the end of this year following the statements that the bank had made in August. We now don't think that uh, on pretty much everyone else uh, because of the inflationary pressures and the strength of the, the economy that we've seen in GDP numbers. Um, there is no doubt that inflation is going to have a knock-on effect on the economy um, because uh, it means that real disposable incomes are not likely to be as strong as they otherwise would be uh, and that is going to damage consumer sentiment and we'll see some knock-on effects there which will, will damage growth. And I'm, I'm with Robert that the medium to long term outcome here does not look that great uh, depending on the settlement that we get with the EU. So, so we do expect more inflation. Whether or not the bank actually cares about inflation, this is quite a controversial thing to say, is another matter. So the evidence is that when we are in um, unstable circumstances like the one that we're in at the moment, uh, the bank tends to rely on the flexibility and the remit that it has from the Treasury to prioritise stability and economic growth over precise targeting of inflation. And I think we're likely to see that from the bank, particularly under a Carney governorship uh, over the next few years. He is very sensitive indeed to the political need to be seen to be acting and acting in favour of growth. So I'm not sure that they are that worried about inflation straying uh, away from the target. So the forecast at the moment is 2.7%, uh, I think some years out. Um, actually, they, what they should be saying is it's 2% in a few years out because we're targeting it, but they seem not to be saying that. They seem to be saying we'll tolerate 2.7% inflation over the next few years because we don't want to slam the brakes on through a, a sharp increase in interest rates. So I think our view is probably going to be, we haven't worked this through yet, uh, that we do expect a, 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 an increase in interest rates, but it will be a fairly long time coming. You know, we're still in that lower for longer world of uh, global low interest rates and some deflation actually elsewhere in the global economy. Okay, thank you. <coughs> Other questions? Uh, while we're waiting for that, uh, let me pose one, and uh, Miles, perhaps you can can take this first in terms of. So what are the politicians thinking in terms of how can the government tighten immigration controls, which I think was a major impetus uh, by the vote to leave, and still securing access uh, to the markets from the EU partners? Yes, I mean, I don't think that the EU is going to compromise on the core principle, which is <coughs> that you can't have market access unless you offer some freedom of movement. That is so intrinsically part of the EU settlement or the, the construction of the EU, but I think the Germans in particular, and to a lesser extent the French, will be really very, very concerned to see that principle any more eroded than David Cameron was able to achieve back in February. So if that's true, then there is a trade-off here, and, and as I said in my remarks, I think the trade-off will be that there will be some freedom of movement. You know, we will not be able to get away with, I don't think the politicians will be able to get away with the argument that we can have what we want on immigration. The pressure from business the pressure for employers, organizations, and trade unions to secure some kind of market access and to have an adequate flow of workers into the UK in order to support our economy will be sufficient to stop the Prime Minister from a very, very hard line position which slams the brakes on inward immigration. And, and actually, the institutional pressures of government, I think, will prefer that too. The Treasury is very, very concerned about slamming the brakes on, on migration because of the effect on the economy. 
the EU workforce is 7% of our workforce, which is higher than the number of unemployed people in the UK. So it's really very substantial. So uh, I think what will happen is that we will see some controls on freedom of movement. Quite how many uh, is difficult to guess, but I don't expect a hardline position. And to the extent that there is not a hardline position on immigration, there is some flex to do a deal on market access. But quite what that will be, I don't know. By the way, um, I don't think that anybody should be surprised that we're hearing a we'll have our cake and eat it kind of narrative from the government, from the UK government. Of course we would say that. No one goes into a negotiation saying, oh, all right, then we'll give you something that you want. You start with a very hard line, very aggressive, very obnoxious position, and you say, well, everything, thanks very much, what can you offer? Certainly that's the way I start negotiation. We're real estate people. I mean, that's how we normally start negotiations. Right? <laughs> so, so don't be surprised at that. And you need to, you know, it takes time for the chips to appear in the, in, or the cracks to appear in that argument on both sides. Let's go over here first. Um, there's a lot of talk about uh, restricting the movement of unskilled labour or no skilled labour. Um, that's a big part of our industry in terms of construction, development and infrastructure. Where does the future of UK real estate lie if we can't build Heathrow to uh, runway 3, if we can't build big office buildings in the city to house our occupants, and even in the residential sector where you know, a lot of us of the younger generations are struggling to find affordable housing, even in, in the sort of higher wage levels, because there is just not enough supply for us to then go and be able to afford it and even approach the chance of buying it. I mean, my view is, I think we'll still do it. For example, I think we'll still build Heathrow, it'll just be more expensive. And the cost-benefit analysis won't stack up as well, but because Heathrow is a strategic decision, not a cost-benefit decision, uh, we're going to do it anyway. Well, I think, I think the, the, the issue is more for the private development sector because um, already construction costs were skyrocketing in the last two or three years. That's made a lot of developers think very hard about whether they should be committing to new development. And in many cases where they, um, they've, they've had to make commitments, their returns um, have, have suffered quite considerably. Uh, and now, with the likely fall in values to some extent, maybe, maybe not significant, but some falls, if there's continued pressure on um, construction employment costs, Result of restrictions on the labour supply, then you could have a continuing problem of labour shortages, uh, fairly high construction costs, which could limit the commitments from the development. I think this is definitely showing up on the supply side in our numbers that one of the impacts of the referendum has been that a large number of developers have just refused to commit now because they can't see what the occupier and demand side looks like that far out. And so with the honourable exception of 22 Bishopsgate, where we heard recently that they are deciding to press the button on over a million square feet of office space right in the middle of the city, um, there are a number of developers saying out there, let's just wait. And ironically, that means the demand for construction goes down in some cases. So there's a short-term effect, which is the demand goes down, and the long-term effect that the demand goes back up again, or the cost goes back up again because of that inflation. You've probably seen that in your numbers too. Yeah, in some respect it may not be a bad thing. There's a, a glut of supply going to hit London quite soon. So if there's a kind of softening, maybe you know, less more development might be a good thing. In, in terms of, I mean, I think affordability issue, we've got gentlemen raised in terms of residential affordability, is a huge, huge, huge issue. In some respect, a bigger issue than Brexit in, in terms of London, because people can't afford it to, to live here. So I think, actually, I welcome Savile's forecast saying, Growth is going to fall from 30% to 30%, and actually that might actually be a good thing. Yeah, no, I think it, it certainly will be good for people who, who are trying to get more help. We had a question in the back. Hi, I was just wondering where you see the future of the EU as a kind of trade and local political union. So I'm heard rumors of um, Eurosceptic parties in kind of France, Netherlands, South Mexico, and Mexico, and even the sector for Spain. Um, I was just wondering whether you see this coming to fruition in the next few years. And so, does that give the UK a strategic advantage over the first move? Uh, no, there's no first move advantage here, I don't think. Um, and I don't, I don't think it's very likely that we will see um, a wider meltdown in the European Union. I mean, the European Union has a meltdown every five years, right? So we had one about 2011, 2012, it's having another one now. Um, and we are the cause this time around, the Greeks were the cause last time around. Um, 
this, this is a, an institution which is a very difficult deal. It's 28 different countries with different perspectives on them to try and make things work because they know that the alternative is much, much worse. And, and the worseness of the Second World War still plays an enormous amount of importance in French and German and Italian minds. And it should in ours too, so. but certainly in French, German and Italian minds, that is still the driver, 60, 70 years on, of the mentality around Europe. The Germans and the French are desperate to hold this thing together. They are desperate to keep the UK in the European family. They don't like the idea of isolation, isolation and breakup. Uh, they don't like the idea of the Eurozone failing because it keeps the continent together. And with Vladimir Putin on the borders invading Ukraine, etc., 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 the Germans are very worried indeed about the wider um, European stability. So I think that they will work very, very hard and bear quite a lot of pain to keep the thing together. We've seen that in the Greek crisis and the migration crisis more recently. The Germans act to keep Europe on the road. Uh, I don't think that the, the Netherlands, Sweden, and Denmark, which are often thought of as the next exitus, as you mentioned, the exit. Um, I think it's very likely. The, the Dutch are a founder member of the EU on one hand, and they are in Europe on the other, so that's really quite difficult for them. <coughs> the Danish and the Swedish are much smaller economies than the UK, I think would be less, you know, much more nervous about going it alone. We're the fifth largest economy in the world, there is at least a decent argument that we could go it alone. So do I hear you saying that you don't believe there's going to be a, a domino effect, if you will, in terms of UK leaves first, uh, who's next? You think the rest of them will stick together? Yeah, and so some people make the counter <coughs> which is that the European Union becomes a stronger and more cohesive uh, unit without the British, who are serial offenders in Brussels. You know, we, we disagree, the stats bear this out, really useful note for Goldman Sachs the other day, we disagree <coughs> in Europe more than anyone else. The Germans and the French agree with each other and with the Italians more than anyone else. So we are the Orbit Squad. So getting rid of the Orbit Squad has some benefits in keeping the cohesiveness of the European Union um, together. Okay, interesting. Other questions, comments? Okay, we've got a mic coming to you. Uh, in terms of time, and I don't know uh, what was questioned on last night, I had the misfortune of watching it for about 15 minutes before I switch it off, but there's a general theme developing from the audience there. So Regard to the notice, it's my understanding that you can put the notice in and then be the same day as you put the notice in. What's wrong? And this is a question for the panel. So what's wrong with uh, putting the notice in uh, later to March 17 and then leaving straight away? Because uh, in, in negotiating will be stronger, we're actually having left. We'd stay in. Because once you stay in, you've got two years of just doing nothing. We're not going to achieve anything in the other two years. Uh, we've got the general election coming up and we've got Carly leaving in 19 as well. It would seem to me that March 17 is the right time to leave, but I just be wondering if you will Well, business not terrible to accept it. Yeah, and the court may prevent us from leaving, but um, it seems to me that you, technically speaking, you cannot leave the day after you serve the notice because there needs to be ratification of the, the failure to reach agreement. So, um, you know, the European Parliament has got to ratify the agreement, we've got to ratify the agreement, so has the European Council by a qualified majority. So there's a process for working out whether we agree with the British or not um, that has to happen in Brussels. That cannot happen in a day. But, um, you know, there is an argument that says, well, let's not even bother. You know, let's not even bother having this negotiation. Let's just buy our way out, get on with it. Um, it would certainly solve a lot of the uncertainty problems of business, because at least we know where we are. But I think we are going to react very adversely to that if we were to do it. Well, I mean, the, the stats that I, that I show suggest that if we did that, we ended up in a WTO situation. We're going to be fairly, fairly dire straits in terms of what it's going to do to our, our, our likely growth, because we wouldn't have renegotiated various trade agreements <coughs> around the world that would take it, it would take 10 years to do that in terms of major trade agreements. So it would be a, period, a big period of weakness if we did that. Next question or comment? Um, do you think, I mean, we've seen the statistics and investment doesn't seem to have taken a massive, massive hit recently. Obviously comparing with last year, that was a really good year. Um, so we don't seem to be in, in turmoil yet, but everyone keeps talking about how this uncertainty um, is going to go on and on two years, three years, four years. Are we at a risk that um, new investors are going to get sort of impatient waiting to find out what's happening here and their attention will go elsewhere and London will kind of fade into insignificance? Um, well, 
Yeah, I think so. it's a mixed picture, isn't it? I think um, London is still known. Whatever happens, it's a global city. It's one of the most important cities in the world. It's a magnet for investment, for capital. Uh, there's huge, there are literally tens and tens and tens of billions of capital floating around the world. Uh, it's, you know, 200 billionaires in China, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, all looking for a place to invest money, uh, even if it's just seen as a, a safe haven. I think London still has all those, but a lot of those characteristics. I think it will remain a magnet. Of course, there are obviously opportunities elsewhere. If the Eurozone finally you know, shakes off its kind of malaise, and I'm still actually quite down on the Eurozone and the Euro for, uh, the Euro for a number of reasons. Uh, I'm sure there'll be other opportunities elsewhere, but I think just the, the sheer amount of global capital looking for a place. In you know, London, it still looks very attractive. With the, where we are with Pound, it's even more attractive than it has been for some time. So I think, you know, some investors may may pause, but as you saw from this from my slides earlier, you'll see new investors coming in. Yeah. Uh, I'll tell you, there's actually groups of people that are waiting for more uncertainty because that will mean potential price decreases. So there's actually people that are out there selling now and building war chests to be ready so when the market does go further down, knowing in the long term London will always be here, they will pounce on those opportunities and we we see that uh, those investors continuing to uh, ask the questions, understand from the states, you know, how to get here, where are the deals. So, uh, you know, I just think that London being where it is, uh, that uncertainty will just bring additional investors. So what I hear you saying is a little blood in the water is not necessarily a bad thing. You know, uh, everybody in this water. room knows. Everybody in this room knows that there's two sides of a trade, and you know, there's winner and losers. Always has been, always will be. Uh, and then there's some people to just say, hey, listen, this property stabilized. We've done what we need to do. We've met business plan. We're making some pretty good money. Let's go ahead and trade. Let somebody else come in and they get a lower yield, and then you know they look for the next opportunity to reposition. So I think it's you know we've seen this through the years. I think one of the things that makes this time so different is just the sheer amount of liquidity looking for a home. Okay. All right, we have about uh, ten minutes left till the top of the hour. More questions, comments? Don't be bashful. Um, with the uncertainty in the UK, if Trump wins, will the uncertainty of the US dominate more than the uncertainty of Brexit, and therefore maybe investors prefer to, the, to invest in the UK and look away from the US? Uh, that's actually, <laughs> We're a candidate stuff, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's very good point, actually. Yeah. Yeah. Canadians, Canadians will do well. Um, uh, we think that um, the, the advice from our US colleagues is that the Clinton machine is strong enough to see a vote the line next week. Um, in the event that the Trump win, all of the nerves seem to be around his own trade policy rather than his investment policy. <coughs> so, uh, actually, it may be that the UK, certainly the US government, finds itself in a similar position to the UK government in that it's decided to withdraw from various uh, trade uh, treaties. Uh, that Trump is on record as saying he would withdraw from NAFTA and withdraw from the, the WTO. So, uh, so there are some issues there, um, just uh, and they're the same issues that we would face. Whether that applies to investment, I don't know. I mean, you might the differential between the dollar and the pound is going to be an important thing. The dollar really is very strong, and the pound is relatively weak. So if the differential is the thing that drives um, real estate decisions, then I think we'll continue to see, as others in the panel have said, really very strong investment into uh, the UK. And, and US investors tell us we're in London for the long term, in particular London, but also we hear from European investors the UK is still a good place for us to put money because of the diversity benefits. So you know, I don't think that there's really that much effect on investment. We're, we're a pretty small investment pool relative to the US only. <coughs> Other comments, questions? Okay, you're forcing me to go back to the 
the playbook here then. So uh, given what we know today in facing a separation from the EU, what's the optimal arrangement for the UK in terms of protecting the property sector? So what is on your wish list? So from what we know today, what's on your wish list in terms of how this could turn out best for the property market? I should jump in here as far as the lending is concerned. We've got to have passporting. It's critical <laughs> to our business for us to be able to use that. So any any uh, final uh, deal has to include passporting. And by passporting, defining that for passporting is it's in a number of different sectors, but it basically gives uh, lenders that are based here in uh, the UK, the ability to be able to loan money into uh, the European Union without having an actual uh, fixed base bank there in uh, the EU. It's a, it's a very, very significant uh, point. I guess somebody mentioned it, you mentioned it earlier. It's, it's critical, so that's on the uh, wish list. And also just to have the, uh, the ability for the people that are needed to build the buildings that are needed for the construction loans and to keep uh, construction prices down, uh, the ability of those people to have some type of movement uh, here to the UK. I think uh, as the stats seem to show in the medium to long term, if you don't have um, the ability for services to be sold um, across the EU, um, and then there's a real danger that that's going to have a pretty big impact upon uh, the services sector in the UK, and that in turn will mean some migration, some migration of those businesses to the EU, not not perhaps hugely, and there'll be different arrangements for different companies, but. It would then have some impact potentially on the uh, occupier demand. Um, so I think on the margins, uh, if you, without the passporting, there's, there's going to be still, uh, a fairly significant impact on the uh, occupier demand, and that's going to have an impact potentially on the, on the market, particularly on the market. Uh, yeah, I mean, I think I'm also, you know, us, on the top line, the single most important thing would be passporting because. For, from a real estate perspective, the sheer volume of space taken by financial services, not just in London, but mainly in London, for example, Edinburgh has a very important financial services district as well, um, it is really critical for us. But it's worth saying that the London economy is diversifying quite quickly now, and so if you look at the take-up data, um, whether you know, Richard's data or our data, um, as to which kinds of industries have been taking space in London over the last few years, there's a good mix of financial services, but also other professional services, creative, technology, media firms, and London's getting quite good at offering those, a suitable space for that, those kind of firms. And we've seen Google uh, located at King's Cross, we've seen Apple coming at Battersea, those kind of firms are, are probably the future of London real estate uh, to a much greater extent than they've been in the past. So we may be less reliant on financial services, but we shouldn't have kid ourselves that the financial services industry in, in the UK is the world's best uh, end of, with, with a possible exception of New York. But, but why would I say that? Because I'm a Brit. Um, <laughs> so, so you know, we, we have got a global centre here, and that's going to take some great. Richard, and I agree with everything that my colleagues have said. The only thing I would say is that I'm increasingly sceptical whether Brexit is actually going to happen given everything we've seen in the last days, and is this something that's going to get kicked into touch or another referenda? I mean, there's a distinct possibility it's not going to happen. So I think if there was the emergence of a strong opposition, then that might be the case. But because there is no strong opposition in this country at the moment, I think um, they will play to the gallery, the Conservative Party will play to the gallery, and they will have to execute Brexit in some form. Yes, but as uh, one of my former politician and colleagues said, you can play to the gallery, but you get paid by the people in the stores. <coughs> so the, the, I, I'm pretty sure that what's going on in government is that there is a narrative and a rhetoric, and we saw that in spades in Theresa May's conference speech, but there is also a great deal of very hard thinking going on behind the scenes that we're just not seeing, yeah. and a great deal of pragmatism in discussion. <coughs> 
Okay. Well, we're at the top of the hour here. I'm going to throw out uh, one last question uh, in closing. Um, who's the winners and who's the losers? Uh, the losers of the pool. Mm. Uh, you know, because of our view that in the longer term, the UK economy will have probably a lower trend rate of growth because it will not have free access to markets in quite the same way as it did before. Um, it tends to be uh, those who are less well off that will suffer. And the irony being that those are the people actually voted for it. Yeah, the 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 <coughs> Other winners and losers. Chip? You know, I'm, I'm hoping uh, that it all gets sorted in the financial markets and what has been built here in London over the past, what, five, seven years remains. Uh, I do think on the property side there will be definitely uh, people that will be winners and take advantage of some of the fear that's going on of people exiting some of the properties. So I think from that standpoint, there will be some uh, private equity shops and funds that will, will swoop in and take advantage and be winners. Okay, Robin? Um, for me, I think we're all losers in some ways because, um, I mean, clearly there's problems with the EU, big problems in terms of how they do business, the various issues. But I think uh, London has been a huge beneficiary of being part of the EU in terms of free movement, in terms of cultural advantages, in terms of the general um, political stability which the EU has brought um, post-war in Europe. I think um, that's not taken into consideration to a large enough extent within the UK. As was said before, it is understood better on the continent. When we start to, although we, we, we kind of say two things, one, we want to leave the EU and be a big uh, global player on the world stage. Well, the UK has never prevented from being a big player on the global stage anyhow, whether it's known in the EU or not. Um, so I think in some ways we're all a bit poor by not party being part of a, a wider, more free liberal uh, Western European Okay, thank you. So um, I'm, I'm very pleased. I think we've really had an interesting discussion this morning. Obviously, uh, uh, this is a very serious issue um, and a lot uh, that we don't know yet. Um, I think it'd be interesting to uh, come back a year from now and uh, take a look uh, at to where we're at at uh, that point. So uh, would that be something uh, that you would be interested in? Okay. Well, we certainly thank you. Uh, for being here this morning. Uh, uh, please help me in uh, thanking our panel for uh, being here this morning and taking these.